All right. So today uh, we're very happy to have uh, Rajesh Gopakumar uh, talking about from symmetric product CFTs to ADS3. Please, Rajesh, take it away. Thanks, Yorit, and um, uh, great to be there virtually, at least. Uh, it's uh, it's not the best, but it's at least easier. And uh, it's good to be able to do it in a short notice. But um, so, um, uh, so I, I will be mostly talking about uh, uh, this uh, recent paper, uh, which came out like a couple of weeks ago with uh, Matthias Gabardiel, my student Pranabesh Moiti and uh, Matthias' student Bob Knighton. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so let me uh, give a kind of, a, um, oops. Uh, yeah, uh, a sort of a roadmap to the talk. Uh, I, I've tried to, I, I think the basic message I'm trying to get across is very simple and I hope it will not get lost. Uh, so let me just sort of, uh, I'll begin with sort of a little bit of an extended motivation, uh, which uh, has been driving um, all these works. And it's uh, it's about understanding ADS CFT gate string duality. And uh, I, I'll say, some things about how in this correspondence, one uh, about going from the string theory to the field theory, and but mostly I will focus on going from the field theory to the string theory, and um, embed this as part of a general program uh, uh, to do so um, uh, at least for weakly coupled quantum field theories in the large end limit. Uh, but since the uh, so I'll have a sort of a uh, uh, since Steve is there, I, I should have a slogan. So I'll have a slogan at the end of the motivation session. Uh, uh, so, um, which in a way will kind of capture the philosophy uh, um, of uh, the uh, talk. Um, but then we'll sort of uh, plunge into a specific example. And uh, this will involve, as the title says, symmetric product orbifold CFTs in two dimensions. And I'll supply some background on that, uh, in particular, uh, how, uh, how the correlators in these orbifolds are determined in terms of covering maps and so on. Um, so, and then we'll get to the real meat of the, the, uh, the, the talk, uh, which will involve uh, solving, uh, uh, understanding these covering maps, the, the, uh, the correlators in the field theory in a very specific limit, a kind of a large end limit, which will be physically motivated as some kind of a gross mende like limit as well. And we'll see that this limit is uh, uh, admits a sort of a matrix model interpretation and uh, you can exploit that to uh, solve for uh, uh, things explicitly. And um, so then the rest of the talk will be about teasing out the implications from that solution, in particular how that implies that the, the Feynman diagrams of the CFT in some sense cover the a relevant stringy modelized space of the dual string theory in a very explicit realization of the slogan of the philosophy uh, that I would have um, mentioned here. And it, we will also see how the particular, in this particular case, what the integrand on this modelized space uh, looks like and what uh, we'll see a couple of different uh, incarnations of that. and. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll try to put forward some uh, meaning uh, for those um, integrants. Uh, and finally, that will be the outlook. And, and so let's uh, uh, I'll just briefly um, uh, summarize. So, so the motivation. So, so the uh, the uh, the question that's sort of driving all this, and which has been uh, driving a lot of my work in the last many years, is this question here about how exactly large and quantum field theories reorganize themselves into theories of strings as we know they do in many cases. Uh, and of course, we've had the insight from string theory in some bottom up or 
top down, whichever way. Uh, 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 this thing that it's uh, from deep brain physics that open closed string duality is in some sense the underlying reason. Uh, and uh, uh, so you sort of sum over the holes of the open string theory and uh, there's a back reaction which sort of alters the background and you get a purely closed string background so correlators in an open string theory go over to a closed string theory in some postmodern version of the cheshire cat uh, story uh, but this is uh, this is a nice at a pictorial level but it's very difficult to see how this explicitly happens uh, at a large um, uh, Toft coupling or G string times N. Um, and uh, as a result, we are sort of left with many examples, uh, sort of a wealth of examples, uh, but we haven't been able to delineate the scope of gauge string duality. Uh, and each time we rely on some clever D brain construction to give us a new example, but, um, but we haven't been able to, in some sense, first principles, uh, uh, see how these quantum field theories uh, really go over to string theories. So um, as I said, for large g-string n or Toft coupling, that's a little difficult. And that's where most uh, investigations are, because that's, of course, very fascinating from the dual gravity point of view. You have, uh, you have classical gravity and, uh, and its correction. So this is sort of a, a plot I like to uh, put with one over n and um, the vertical axis and the Toft coupling and the horizontal axis. Um, and uh, uh, so this uh, this little uh, corner over here where the where the uh, Toft coupling is very large and we stick to n goes to infinity and maybe uh, take this first one over n corrections and so on. Um, that's more or less where we understand the dual in terms of classical gravity. Uh, and so that's, um, if you wish, the alpha prime goes to zero limit of the dual string theory or uh, equivalently large radius. Uh, but uh, we, uh, I, I'll shift the focus in this talk uh, to this other corner where we understand the field theory, but not the bulk. So the field theory is a weakly coupled field theory. The coupling is going to zero. Uh, and the strong form of the ADS CFD conjecture would imply that uh, the radius is very small, uh, stringy. Uh, so in some sense, it's a tension less limit. Alpha prime goes to infinity. Um, uh, so as per the sort of uh, uh, expected dictionary. But the nice thing about looking at this corner of the lamppost, uh, this uh, part uh, under this lamppost is that um, from the point of view of this open string duality that I just mentioned in the previous slide, uh, the open string theory side is, uh, of course, uh, very much under control. You have a finite number of holes uh, to sum over uh, at uh, weak coupling. And um, at zero coupling, there's strictly a finite number of holes. Uh, of course, a well-defined genus expansion uh, there too. And, um, and you can treat interactions perturbatively as we always do uh, in uh, uh, weakly coupled field theory. So you compute things in terms of correlators in a free quantum field theory. So that UV fixed point uh, of the uh, um, field theory determines the uh, perturbation expansion. So that side is at least very much under our control. Um, so uh, let me um, uh, step back momentarily to uh, say a little bit about what I will view as an operational definition of what constitutes a derivation uh, of ADS-CFT. Uh, so a large part of the ADS-CFT dictionary is this uh, dictionary between uh, correlators of the the boundary CFT uh, endpoint function, uh, let's say an Euclidean correlator in, in a sphere, uh, and you pick out a genus G piece in a large N expansion, and that should ideally be uh, given by a string correlator, uh, which of course by the rules of perturbative string theory is given by some world sheet correlator. And the Zs are the world sheet positions, the Xs are the space-time boundary positions, and I'll use that convention throughout. Um, uh, so uh, we have uh, a world sheet correlator on some genus G surface with n punctures, uh, and you integrate over this modelized space of the string theory. So that's sort of schematically what 
the side ish is and and uh, there's a uh, uh, the field theory correlator. Uh, of course, uh, this is predicated on a dictionary between states itself that there's a one is to one correspondence between the single trace operators here, the single trace gauge invariant operators of the field theory with physical vertex operators of the dual string theory and with the labels matching and I'll sort of use H for the conformal dimension of the space-time theory. Uh, so, uh, so as uh, uh, I mean, the 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 uh, this uh, is a very clean uh, uh, arena to to talk about uh, matching the both matching both sides because in some sense the left hand side is computed with its own set of rules and what you and your, uh, your favorite understanding of quantum field theory uh, um, uh, tells you how to compute things on this side and uh, there there is at least in uh, many cases a uh, perturbative sigma model understanding of um, uh, uh, of what the dual string theory is though that um, there are, I, I don't want to go into the questions about uh, Ramon Ramon fields and technicalities, but I'm assuming that those are technicalities which eventually are going to get sorted out. But in principle, at least this uh, side exists uh, autonomously, and I, uh, at least that's my uh, premise. Uh, so it's a mathematically well posed question to talk about the quality of this. And, try to make it manifest uh, that this side, uh, these two sides are really equal in some sense uh, to say tautologize this uh, correspondence. Uh, so, uh, so of course, uh, this is philosophy, but um, uh, uh, um, uh, as a proof of concept, uh, I'd like to focus on a particular example, which uh, is, sorry, uh, is a, a tensionless limit of the ADS3 CFT2 correspondence, uh, which I think makes much of this discussion very concrete, very explicit. Uh, uh, you can sort of, I think now ask it many questions and it sort of gives you answers. So it's, I think, a very good testing ground to carry this out. Uh, so the the basic claim is that the string theory on ADS three times S three times T four, one of the canonical supersymmetric backgrounds, uh, with one unit of NSNS flux, the minimal unit of NSNS flux, is exactly dual to a symmetric orbifold CFT in some large n limit, um, and um, uh, this was something. Uh, we first checked at the level of the spectrum uh, with uh, Lawrence uh, Eberhardt and Matthias Gabadiel, and then uh, at the level of correlators, uh, um, which was the subject of my talk at strings. And uh, so I will not actually talk about uh, that aspect. Um, uh, I just want to summarize a bottom line from all those investigations, uh, which is that. Um, so there we were mostly focusing on the right hand side of this uh, equality and um, looked at the world sheet theory uh, and found that it had uh, so the world sheet theory is of this ADS three with um, one unit of flux and that world sheet theory can be described in a sort of a hybrid formalism and um, one found that the world sheet correlators on the right hand side actually have a very unusual delta function localization uh, onto points on the modelized space. And these particular points on the modelized space of, uh, let's say, the n-punctured sphere, genus zero, for instance, though some of this has been generalized also to higher genus, um, uh, this delta function localization is onto points which admit uh, branched covers of the world sheet to the boundary sphere. So in this case, the boundary uh, is an S2. So the Xs live on the boundary of the ADS3. And the world sheet we are taking to be also um, uh, genus zero. So we have covering maps uh, from um, the, the world sheet to the target space. And um, uh, what we found was that if you look at these correlators, they essentially get contributions only if the corresponding points Xi of the vertex operators are given, uh, are the images of a covering map. 
uh, with the right branching WI as uh, so W's label the sort of twisted sector in the from the point of view of the orbifold safety or equivalently a spectrally flowed sector from the point of view of the world sheet theory the, the labels are the same so this branching uh, reflects that, uh, so in mathematical terms, the map from the world sheet to the target space uh, must behave like this in the vicinity of the insertion point ZI. Now, I'll have some more to say about covering maps later, but, uh, but this is a rigid condition, as I will mention later, and in fact, uh, this localizes to discrete points because there are n minus three delta functions, and that's the uh, uh, um, uh, complex dimension of uh, uh, the modelized space of the n punctured sphere. And um, uh, uh, so, in our uh, original papers, we actually showed from the ward identities of this that the ward identities in the spectrally flowed sector of these correlators um, actually. Uh, have a solution which is like this, and we found a lot of supporting uh, uh, reasons why that um, had to be the correct solution. Uh, uh, but in a recent paper, which I will again not talk about, but uh, was a few months ago, we actually uh, uncovered a underlying geometrical reason uh, for why this localization happens, and that follows from a certain free field realization of the world sheet theory that exists at k equal to one. In terms of these free fields, there's a sort of a twister-like relation that the free fields obey, which uh, underlies this localization. But this is what uh, the, uh, the world sheet theory gives you. And what we showed was that this localization is precisely what is needed to reproduce the answers of the uh, symmetric orbifold CFT. Uh, but, um, uh, but as I said, I will have not much more to say about the world sheet uh, theory, um, uh, the uh, autonomously defined world sheet theory in this talk. I will be mostly focusing now on this side and, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and we'll make connection to the same, uh, uh, the same things, but coming from an opposite end. Okay, so uh, so yeah, so um, uh, so there's uh, so when I wrote this sort of operational definition of equality of these correlators, you might have noticed a sort of an apparent asymmetry in this equality. In some sense, it's easier to go from the right hand side to the left hand side, and that's from from strings from the string theory to the field theory you evaluate and that's what we did and that's what i sort of summarized in my previous slide now we you can evaluate the correlators on this side through whatever techniques you might have and you can um, you can carry out the integral over the modelized space and uh, 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 and uh, see whether that uh, agrees or uh, it can be rewritten as the correlators of the uh, orbifold CFT. But if you wanted to go the other way around, if you wanted to go from the fields to strings, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, at first sight, it seems like an inverse problem, which is not very well defined, uh, uh, because you are trying to reconstruct a world sheet integrand, which is, of course, not unique. And we know that, uh, of course, uh, from uh, our studies of world sheet string theory in uh, flat space that you can always add total derivatives and so on. But um, uh, but nevertheless, uh, one can one might hope to have a canonical or a natural form for the correlators on the right hand side, which is something we also see. Uh, there's often very special gauges. Uh, on in which uh, things simplify on the right hand side. So you might try to um, this thing. So it's not totally hopeless in principle. Uh, and in fact, uh, the sort of uh, the program that I was um, advocating uh, for uh, uh, some years was uh, to recast uh, these correlators into stringy correlators in a very specific fashion um, uh, uh, which uh, would kind of, uh, which would kind of canonically assign a, a stringy uh, world sheet integrand and uh, so let me explain the philosophy of that and then we'll uh, flesh it out later in this talk so the philosophy is very simple in some sense the left hand side at least if you're considering the free field uv fixed point uh, is given in terms of 
Feynman diagrams. Uh, that's how you compute uh, uh, the left-hand side. And um, you view the Feynman diagrams as different world lines and different world line topologies, in fact. Um, and the sum over Feynman diagrams, the sum over is a sum over world line topologies. And you reorganize that sum over world line topologies into a sum over the distinct world sheets, which is actually an integral, but uh, 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 Would so, that be a, like a simplicial decomposition? Are you thinking that the world lines are cutting out sections of a yeah yeah of the world I, sheet I and, and they're just different slicings? Yes, that's the basic idea. I, I will I'll be more precise about it in the latter part of this talk, uh, uh, but that's the basic idea. Thank you. Um, so, um, so uh, this uh, sum over these world the distinct world sheets uh, would sort of come from gluing up these double lines that the large N Feynman diagrams uh, uh, essentially um, uh, give you. Uh, and so, let me just say a little bit more about that and uh, sort of introduce my slogan. Um, so, this is what I uh, had in the last sentence. Uh, now in pictures that the sum of all these diagrams, the sum of uh, all the Feynman diagrams that contribute to some endpoint correlator uh, is equal to the sum or the integral over the world sheets. Uh, and the way you would do it, and, and that's the nice thing about working with the free field diagrams is that you start with some finite set of diagrams over here, and uh, that must somehow reassemble into uh, the world sheets of the dual string theory. And you would like to implement in some concrete way this open closed string duality. And we'll see in some ways, if you view these as the Feynman, the double line, the ribbon graphs of the Feynman diagrams, you're sort of gluing them up in a canonical way to form the dual uh, closed string world sheet. Uh, and uh, so the slogan is that for each Feynman diagram, sort of each summoned over here, there'll be sort of a summoned over here. Each Feynman diagram has a one is to one association in at least a canonical sense uh, with a closed world sheet. And this will uh, exploit a certain, as uh, was just mentioned, a cell decomposition of the modelized space, uh, which comes from, uh, which is a very specific cell decomposition, it comes from a certain uh, thing called the Strebel differential, but uh, I will explain that more later. Uh, so in some sense, this is, uh, I view this as a refinement of the Tuft idea where you, you could assign a genus to these Feynman diagrams, to all these Feynman diagrams. That was the, uh, the canonical genus uh, that you assigned to these ribbon graphs. But uh, what I'm saying here is more that not only can you assign a genus for each of these uh, diagrams, there's a specific point on the modelized space of the dual world sheet. Uh, so that the sum is really the integral of the dual uh, string theory. So that's sort of the first part of what you would like to do in going from fields to strings. You would like to be like to transform the field theory into a stringy correlator. Uh, and this is a sort of a, uh, this is a canonical way in which you can do that. But then of course the dynamical thing is, is what is the integrand and we'll come to that in the, at least in this specific case. And, uh, uh, yes, please. Can I ask you a real, really remedial question? Because I'm getting myself confused. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, in the early days of perturbative string theory, there, there are these relations between open string diagrams and closed string diagrams, like I guess they were called KLT relations or whatever, uh, where yeah. in some sense, some appropriate sense, you can indeed think of the closed string one as the gluing together of open string ones. Um, uh, but that's all in the same dimensionality. You don't have yeah, the aspect of, yeah, the, of yeah. the radial emergent dimension. So, whereas Tuff's thing with genus was more, um, I mean, via ADSDFT, at least we understand how that involves the. Yeah. So it's it's somewhat it's somewhat different because um, uh, here you're looking at correlate. Uh, yeah. There, in some sense, you looked at scattering amplitudes of open strings and uh, uh, the the. Uh, like Yang Mills amplitudes and so on. Uh, whereas here you're looking at gauge invariant correlators and, uh, and the dual objects are 
so so the the correlators so you don't have to square anything over here the correlators in some sense uh, are capturing that gauge invariant uh, information in the open string theory and uh, and giving you the um, uh, the uh, dual closed string theory and and it's not i think in those cases i I don't think it's a open. It's not a, at least in any simple way. I think an open closed string duality because it's more like you're kind of putting together two copies of open strings and sort of sewing them together. So it's slightly different, I think, in spirit. But there might be more to it than I have have thought. Um, thank, thank you. So, uh, so okay, so that was sort of motivation. And as I said, the slogan is uh, that in which we'll try to uh, try to kind of um, uh, make concrete is, uh, is how you can uh, see an assignment from each Feynman diagram to a kind of a closed string world sheet. So as I said, uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll look at this idea of going from field theory to the string theory, but focus on this specific test case that we have uh, very much under control, uh, where the CFT is uh, a symmetric all before CFT, uh, uh, which in some large K limit, because I'll have a different N and so I don't want that. So we'll always work in this uh, large K limit of the symmetric all before. Uh, and uh, for simplicity, and uh, as will hopefully be clear, it won't really matter very much. But we will we will stick to uh, correlators of the um, uh, ground states of the relevant twisted sectors. So I, I let Ws be arbitrary. I'll take an arbitrary endpoint function, uh, but I, I'll stick to the uh, the ground states in each of these twisted sectors. The uh, so let me just, uh, for those who are maybe not so familiar with the symmetric orbifold, the analog of the single trace operators uh, of the uh, uh, symmetric orbifold theory are the so-called single cycle twisted states, where uh, the uh, permutations that arise in this SK uh, consist of essentially one non-trivial W cycle of length W. Uh, uh, and uh, so those correspond to kind of the single cycle, uh, single trace operators, because you can sort of see it's similar. Uh, you're taking a cyclic uh, uh, kind of a product. And um, uh, uh, so uh, uh, the ground state in each uh, of these sectors is well defined. And uh, uh, we can consider an arbitrary endpoint function of these uh, correlators uh, of these uh, operators uh, on S2. Uh, uh, it's a bit like when you do perturbative string theory, you, you always talk about tachyon scattering amplitudes. It's a bit like that. So if you wish, you can think of these as the e to the ikx versions. I mean, the analogs of the e to the ikxs that you do in flat space string theory. Putting in oscillators and so on is just additional bells and whistles. So uh, we won't really bother about that as uh, the the whole thing sort of just goes through uh, uh, for all those things. Um, so uh, so so we st uh, we as I said we'll focus on the field theory from now on, and uh, I'll be uh, talking about these correlators uh, and tell you a little bit about the background of what was known about these correlators and how to compute them. So. Um, uh, uh, an insight that we will use a lot is that of Lunin and Mathur, who about 20 years ago uh, realized that the, there's a clever way to compute these correlators, and that is to essentially use the idea of the replica trick, which is to go to a covering space. Uh, uh, I guess very similar things, but not exactly the same, were also done by Dixon and uh, uh, collaborators, but uh, we will use this version of um, uh, the uh, going to the covering space in which you have. Uh, uh, so if you have this is your S2 and you have insertions X1 to Xn, you go to a covering space such that there's a branching a covering map which has a branching at these uh, points 
uh, which is of the same uh, uh, order wi as the twisting uh, and uh, the nice thing as you know from uh, probably from the replica trick and so on is that when you go to the covering space the fields are single valued on the covering space uh, and though you've traded it for a sort of a more uh, intricate uh, sheet structure but you have uh, single valued fields and in particular the ground states just go to insertions of the identity on this covering space. So in some ways, you have just a vacuum path integral on a single copy of the T4 theory. Instead of multiple copies, uh, the, uh, you get a single copy of the T4 theory. Uh, and so in a sense, this is very tailor-made for the symmetric Cobbefold theory. Uh, uh, so you get a single copy, and you have uh, 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 but the, uh, but you have a branching, non-trivial branching at these points uh, in this encoded in this covering map, uh, for, which is a holomorphic covering map of this auxiliary uh, covering space uh, uh, over the S2. And this uh, auxiliary covering space is what, I mean, just to anticipate things or um, uh, mention it, it, uh, beforehand, this covering space is what turned out when we started from the uh, world sheet point of view, this turned out to be the world sheet as had been sort of guessed earlier, but we could make that very precise that this is indeed the world sheet. Um, so think of this covering space always mentally as the putative world sheet, uh, but, uh, but we, won't, we won't need to make that assumption, but it's useful picture to keep in mind. So now the original correlator, coming back to computing this correlator, once you've taken it to the covering space, all you have to do is sum over all the contributions from all the allowed covering maps. And so there are actually discreetly many covering maps that are allowed if I fix the branching data. So in particular, supposing I were to fix the ZIs, which are uh, the Z are, Zs are the positions on the covering space, uh, uh, slash world sheet, and the X's are the positions on this uh, target space of the sphere uh, where the boundary safety lives. Uh, so if I uh, specify the covering, uh, the covering map uh, with, uh, if I specify the data, the ZIs and the WIs, um, and then uh, three positions on the target space, let's say X1, X2, Xn, I put them at zero, one, and infinity or somewhere else, uh, I specify three points, then the covering map is actually completely specified. You can look at the equations that determine it and see that uh, essentially all the remaining, you don't have any choice with the remaining XIs. So if I specify this data and uh, I specify that the, it has to have this branching, then the remaining XIs are essentially fixed. Uh, and Maybe it'll become a little clearer later, but um, and so uh, equivalently, I could do it the other way around. If I were to specify all the XIs, which in a sense is what we are doing in this problem, because I fix the XIs here, and I look at the covering, I look at where the covering maps are. I essentially can determine the covering map uh, if I fix the XIs and the WIs as over here. Then the ZIs are essentially fixed, uh, or rather the cross ratio, n minus three of them are fixed. I can choose three of them to be at zero, one, and infinity uh, on the covering space. But the remaining n minus three are essentially fixed. Um, but there's a discrete choice of uh, them. It's not, there's a, it's not that there's a unique covering map. Uh, there, there's, there's a, there are discreetly many of them. Uh, and so it corresponds, if you wish, from this point of view, on the modelized space of the uh, of the covering space, there are you're picking out discreetly many points uh, when you specify this data. Um, so, uh, uh, so one point I just if uh, I just want to uh, preemptively address is that if you were wondering, yeah, I've lifted uh, this uh, uh, theory to the covering space and uh, the ground state correlators just lift a vacuum path integral. Then where did all the position dependence go? Well, of course, it has to be there. The position dependence comes from the pullback. Uh, or from the covering map onto the uh, pullback onto the covering map uh, of uh, uh, del gamma because that induces 
a metric on the covering space. So supposing my original metric uh, here was a flat metric, then I induce a metric by with del gamma uh, on the covering space. And uh, that's an almost flat metric, but uh, there's a conformal factor that's essentially mod of del gamma square, uh, uh, or phi is uh, e to the phi is uh, mod del gamma square. So the uh, so this conformal factor uh, you have to uh, you get a usual Liouville sort of an anomaly uh, from that, and that is the usual sort of uh, uh, piece over. Here. Uh, here in terms of this conformal factor. So this conformal factor, of course, knows about all the positions and the Ws and so on. And you evaluate this Liouville action, essentially, uh, to leading order. And in some sense, you evaluate the Liouville action and you get all the dependence on the Xs from there. Uh, you have to be careful with some regularization and normalization. Uh, um, uh, and that is what would give you the ground state computation. Uh, there's a nice interpretation for this, which is, again, not very well known. It was uh, suggested about uh, 10 years after the lunin mathur calculation by these folks, uh, which is that you can associate a free field like uh, Feynman diagram for each of these covering map contributions. Um, so the way you do it is the following. You start with the X space, the target space, and you, um, uh, you have, let's say, a four-point function. Draw a curve, a sort of a Jordan curve through these points, but it's sort of like a bifundamental curve where you have a solid uh, curve and, uh, and a dashed curve next to it. Uh, and uh, let's say we uh, choose some convention so that the solid curve encloses x equal to infinity. This will be clearer uh, when I, uh, a little later, why I'm doing this. But, uh, but let's say we, we can always choose a Jordan curve and draw this uh, solid line uh, passing through all the points. Uh, which encloses uh, infinity, and then there's the dashed line which encloses the remaining hemisphere uh, of the um, uh, of the sphere. Now look at what uh, the image of this is, or the pre-image of this is under this covering map to on the on the covering space, uh, and and what you find is that because this is a dig when you have a degree n map, there'll be n pre-images of all the regular points. Of course, there'll be branch points, uh, which will have fewer. But so what you will have is actually a structure, something like this. Uh, and uh, uh, and so this is a degree three map uh, I've sort of shown. And there are three pre-images of these uh, x equal to infinity. So x equal to infinity are really the poles of uh, gamma of z. So that's why I uh, specifically uh, um, uh, mentioned that. And that will be important for us later. But uh, so, uh, uh, so, uh, so the poles of gamma of z are x equal to infinity. And there'll be, um, there'll be uh, uh, n of these. Uh, and then, of course, there'll be the branch, uh, the the uh, the branch points, and there'll be some uh, structure which is like a double line Feynman diagram. And the nice thing is that this triangulates the covering space very much like um, the Toft large n Feynman diagram uh, uh, triangulates the covering space of the uh, triangulates the. Uh, sort of a world sheet large in uh, 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 theory in usual Yang Mills theory. So this is the analog of the Toft uh, uh, ribbon diagrams now for this uh, uh, symmetric orbifold theory. So that tells you that there's actually a Feynman diagram like picture. And for each covering map, you get a different graph. So all the distinctly many covering maps that I said give you distinctly many graphs. It's a bit like in Yang Mills theory, there are a finite number of different graphs that contribute to a correlator. Those will correspond to different kind of, so to say, big contractions between these vertices uh, and uh, give you a triangulation on of the covering space. OK. <laughs> Uh, uh, finally, before uh, and, uh, the last part of the background, I, I just want to say something about 
computing these coverings, which will be important for what follows, the covering maps are very hard to write down explicitly, even for a four point function on a sphere. Uh, so uh, let me stick to, as I have been doing, the genus zero covering space, uh, and but with endpoints and a degree n map. So gamma is uh, from the world sheet to the boundary S2, uh, uh, n punctured sphere. Uh, is my covering space and uh, uh, and the boundary S2 with its uh, insertions. And this is a degree N map. So a degree N map from a sphere, so this is the topology of a sphere to uh, so a uh, holomorphic map from sphere to the sphere. It can be written as a rational function polynomial of degree n divided by a polynomial of degree n. Uh, uh, I'll focus on the polynomial of degree n in the denominator. And uh, since if there are no, uh, if the infinity is not a branch point, then it's uh, you have simple, uh, this factorizes into simple uh, uh, distinct lambda a's. And these are the poles that I mentioned, uh, which appeared. So the pre-images are these lambda a's are the ones that map to infinity on the sphere. So the, the black dots are essentially the positions of the lambda A's. And um, so this is the general structure that the covering map must have. Um, and and the, when you take the derivative of the covering map, now that's the one which has the branching. So it, you know that it del gamma has branching W i minus one because gamma went like that minus zi to the wi. So del gamma has to go like this. So it has to vanish with this order. And you find that it actually, because it's a polynomial, it must be of this product form. And uh, this uh, the denominator gives you double poles because of the fact that there are single poles here. Uh, I'll choose the convention that zn is infinity. but So there'll be sort of n minus one of these. Uh, and branch points uh, on the covering space. But um, now, uh, so this, the, the one way to compute these covering maps, at least in principle, is to, uh, is the following a nice way that was uh, outlined uh, in a recent paper, um, which is that you look at del gamma and require that there are no simple poles at lambda a, because uh, if there were simple poles, then when you integrated del gamma, you would get logs, but you don't have any logs here. Uh, um, so, uh, so there are no simple poles here. And the condition for that, uh, if you write it down, it's just a couple of lines uh, to convince yourself that the condition is essentially uh, something like this, where you have uh, the from the numerator, the wi minus 1, and lambda a minus zi, and then the denominator denominator you get a term which is lambda a minus lambda b and you this is for each lambda a uh, you have so n equations uh, for each of the lambda a and um, these uh, were actually called scattering equations by uh, rumpadakis and uh, th this is one way to set up how to solve for these covering maps. Uh, you, you basically are trying to solve these n equations uh, uh, for the lambda a's. And uh, then if I specify the zi's and the wi's, then the covering map gets uniquely specified, well, specified up to uh, some uh, constants which correspond to fixing the Mobius invariance, but essentially gets fixed once I solve for these uh, uh, for, uh, for these equations for the lambda a's. So in this uh, way of setting up the problem, the lamp, these poles are the variables you're trying to solve for. Okay, so that was sort of the background. Well, I've taken a long time with that, but uh, um, uh, now let me go, as I said, to the what we actually did, uh, which, uh, um, uh, uh, which is to look at these correlators. Uh, so, so as I said, the, the idea is to try to go to rewrite these into in a stringy and uh, see where the sort of string theory comes uh, come, uh, comes out of these correlators. Uh, so you have this genus zero um, contribution to the uh, to the correlators. We'll take the special limit uh, where the dimensions. Uh, or the energies are very large. So now the, the conformal dimension for the twisted sector W field is W square minus one by four W. Uh, um, so you, by taking W large, you're essentially 
uh, uh, taking these dimensions or these energies very large. Uh, so we will, uh, that's the limit we'll, uh, we'll study. Uh, as I just mentioned, each such, co these correlators get contributions from a finite number of covering maps. Uh, if you want to be more precise, the, the, the number go, grows like n to the 2n minus 6 for a, a little n is the number of points. Uh, and capital N is the degree of the map, which is given in terms of the Ws by this Riemann Horowitz formula. Uh, so, uh, so essentially, the number grows with N uh, as some large power. Uh, for a four point function, it goes like N square. Uh, um, uh, so, the, um, uh, so, there's a finite number of them, but a large number of them. So, these uh, Lunen Mathur covering maps are at uh, you get contributions from all these finite number of points on the modelized space. Uh, but uh, if you want to see the full stringy modelized space, then nat the natural thing to do is to consider this sort of gross Mende like limit where you take all the W's very large such that you keep WI by N, the degree fixed, uh, uh, call that alpha. Then the conformal dimensions uh, grow as n, so you're taking n to infinity, w to infinity, uh, uh, and uh, so the conformal dimensions are all growing with some uh, coefficients alpha i. Uh, so that's the gross mende like uh, limit that we will be considering uh, for this correlator. And because we are taking n large, you might hope to now kind of populate the world sheet uh, modelized space, and we'll see indeed how that works. So, uh, so let, uh, what we will employ is this method that I just reviewed of uh, finding the covering maps. Uh, um, so as I said, it's very hard in general because you have to solve these scattering equations for these lambda a's. Uh, uh, but uh, the nice thing is that this particular large n limit that we consider is sort of this uh, tailor-made to sort of uh, simplify or to solve this uh, set of equations, because uh, those who are familiar with matrix models will recognize that this, uh, this equation for large n is essentially the saddle point equation that you have when you are uh, trying to solve for a matrix integral uh, with lambda a's playing the role of the eigenvalues. And this is sort of the coming from the van der Monde. In fact, the factor of two comes out very naturally here as well. Uh, and this side is sort of the derivative of the potential. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and the potential here is uh, uh, yeah, the, the derivative being one over, uh, one over lambda uh, means that the potential is uh, essentially a logarithmic potential. So, uh, so this, uh, so the sub, uh, uh, matrix integral uh, at large n with this kind of potential will have this as its saddle point equation. Uh, and these models with this sort of logarithmic potential are uh, have appeared in the literature before. They are what are called Penner-like matrix models. Uh, and they appeared in the context, very unrelated context of, uh, uh, of uh, the AGT and its relation to topological strings and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, but in any case, this uh, is a, a, a nice matrix uh, model uh, and you can solve for the equations using the standard matrix model technology, uh, which is that you introduce this sort of a resolvent uh, in terms of the eigenvalue density uh, and um, and then uh, the resolvent, or rather a shifted uh, version of it, uh, in terms of uh, some, something that will be important with uh, the so-called spectral curve, uh, y of z. Uh, this uh, will uh, the shifted by the potential w is will always be for us this logarithmic Penner potential. Uh, so in terms of this potential. This y of z uh, obeys uh, the so-called loop equation, which uh, just essentially follows from uh, rewriting these in terms of the resolvent. Uh, uh, so uh, it's very easy to write down this equation, which is actually true at every order in 1 over n. I mean, it's actually, it has this extra 1 over n piece here. Uh, 
and here and um, so uh, this uh, uh, so you have this loop equation which in a way captures the uh, um, um, eigenvalues and uh, defines for what is known as the spectral curve of the matrix model uh, for reasons that will become clearer so the spectral curve is what uh, uh, will help us to uh, so recall that what we are trying to do here is to solve for this covering maps uh, the covering maps are given in terms of the spectral curve in a very simple way because uh, if I just use this definition, W prime of Z minus two U of Z, you can see that Y of Z is given by this equality. But then you, knowing what I wrote, I mean, knowing the covering map is given by this, you, you can easily see that this is actually the, uh, the second uh, is essentially del of log del gamma. Uh, and uh, uh, recall that this conformal factor uh, phi that appeared in the lunin matter. Uh, so just uh, 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 keep that in mind that this is essentially del phi of this dual field of lunin uh, of lunin and matter. So that's what this uh, loop equation, uh, the solution to the loop equation, gives you the spectral curve, which uh, um, uh, which in turn determines what the covering map is by this relation because at least a leading order in uh, uh, so this y of z uh, uh, has this x uh, this uh, so so far what i've said is true uh, uh, for any n this uh, uh, all these things hold at any n and this equation is also uh, true for any n so Rajesh, uh, just, yes. sorry just to, i'm i'm a little bit lost in the trees here um uh, sure. Eventually, the you know Gross Mende would give a saddle point for the embedding of the string in the target space, which here would have the dimensions of the ADS and the dimensions of the S3 and the torus, right? Uh, yes. So those are all going to be there. Will be some equation like this for all those fields. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so what uh, we will? Uh, so maybe I'll uh, address this question more at the end. Uh, so, uh, uh, what we will? Uh, it's. Uh, the, uh, what we will find is that in this gross mende like limit, we'll actually have an integral over the whole um, modelized space. And I'll tell you what the integrand is, but then the specific point in the modelized space, which ex uh, the gross mende saddle point uh, of that integrand, is actually an interesting mathematical problem which we haven't solved yet, uh, which in principle I think uh, should be something like a minimal area surface in the ADS3 times S3 times T4. Uh, uh, but the T4 pieces are all trivial because we are looking at the, uh, uh, actually the S3 and the T4 pieces are essentially trivial because we are looking at the ground states. But in principle, you can include the oscillators on the T4 and so on. But uh, so the ADS3 is what we will really see the uh, the, the piece really coming uh, from. But uh, yeah, I, I, in some ways, actually, there's a double gross Mende limit over here. I might as well say this now. But um, uh, because in some ways, going to the tensionless limit is already like going to a gross Mende limit. Uh, so in some ways, the free field theory is already in some sort of a gross Mende like limit. Then within that, you can take a further gross Mende like limit. Uh, so because there are two parameters here, there's the string tension. And then there's, again, for the tensionless string theory, there's still, again, the spectrum of conformal dimensions. And you can, again, go to large dimensions. So it's sort of a double gross mende that we are really doing over here uh, and so yeah so the whole setting is in some sense already like a gross mende and the finite number of points that i mentioned on modelized space can be viewed even if without taking the second limit that those can be viewed as sort of saddle points of the first gross mende uh, limit uh, in a way that's i think my physical understanding of why there are finitely many points on the modelized space in this limit uh, so yeah uh, so um uh, so to at large end the spectral curve uh, uh the the loop equation that i just wrote down is very simple it's uh given in terms of the square of the potential and uh, 
this thing which is essentially uh, you know, uh, people who are familiar with matrix models will recognize uh, this sort of an object. It's a, uh, 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 so you can rewrite this and because this uh, W prime is essentially has simple poles. This object has double poles at uh, Z equal to ZI and you and the numerator here is a rational polynomial. Uh, I mean, it's a polynomial. It's uh, uh, polynomials of degree n minus two, the whole square. And uh, this one, uh, from its definition, you can see that you uh, you have this piece, and then and there's another polynomial here. So the whole thing is some polynomial of some degree divided with some double poles here. Uh, and uh, these, uh, uh, so you have these double poles at z equal to z i, and then you have. Uh, this numerator polynomial, which is of degree two n minus four, and it has some number of zeros. Uh, so the way you normally solve these matrix models is that you have the spectral curve, and uh, the unknown thing here is coming from this uh, uh, this mm, uh, this function, which is sort of the quantum correction, uh, uh, and it's a polynomial of degree n minus three, uh, and uh, uh, there are uh, you can take as the unknowns these parameters, uh, the unknown parameters in this polynomial. And uh, we will take also the cross ratios as unknown parameters because we are kind of fixing the xi's and looking for the z's. And these uh, six uh, n minus, two n minus six uh, unknowns can be actually fixed if you, uh, in the language of the matrix models, specify the filling fractions. So recall this why not of Z, the reason it's called a spectral curve is because it's essentially capturing the resolvent, the density of the eigenvalues. So if you, you have various cuts, this is defined on a, a hyperelliptic uh, Riemann surface of uh, genus N minus three, and uh, you have two N minus six independent periods. Uh, and if you specify these uh, two N minus six periods, uh, uh, in terms of some, uh, if I if I tell you these uh, periods, then these parameters are all fixed. Uh, 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 so, and we uh, we will parameterize the different covering maps by these uh, by these two n minus six periods. So, in some sense, these are our free parameters. So, uh, as I mentioned, there are lots of uh, covering maps, discreetly many, but growing with n. Uh, so, they are parameterized by two n minus six parameters. Uh, and once I know, uh, the, if I specify these parameters, and this is one way to specify them uh, with their periods. Uh, then um, uh, essentially the spectral curve is completely determined. And, uh, and once I determine the spectral curve, the covering map is determined essentially uh, up to through this relation that I mentioned earlier. But we'll see what the interpretation of these parameters are. So why it's natural to take these as the parameterizing the uh, different covering maps. But before I do that, I just want to uh, make a uh, side remark about the one over n corrected uh, loop equations. So we looked earlier at only this piece, but there was this other one over n piece as well. Actually, using the fact that y is uh, this del log del gamma, it's uh, this piece very naturally combines into the Schwarzian of the covering map. And this will play a role uh, later. Um, uh, so the Schwarzian of the covering map. Uh, uh, so the loop equation then becomes the, an equation for the Schwarzian uh, in terms of uh, this, uh, these uh, uh, the the right hand side, which is uh, uh, which is what you um, uh, which will be a kind of a of the same form as the leading order, slightly deformed polynomial, uh, uh, but um, it takes this form. Uh, but notice that this right hand side, the Schwarzian is the thing that really transforms as a quadratic differential. Uh, so y of z you normally think of as a differential to at least leading order in n, but uh, to, uh, to subleading order, it is this combination which transforms as a quadratic differential and it has double poles and some residues which are real. Uh, so the, these, uh, this WIs, remember, were the twists. So these residues are real, which will be, again, important. 
Okay, so that was the technical sort of uh, part of it. And uh, uh, well, I have reached one hour. I, I hope I can continue a little bit more. Your it is that uh, uh, yeah, okay? Yeah, you can definitely uh, go on. Yeah. Uh, so, um, um, so now let, we can sort of uh, put this. Uh, talk about the implications of this technical calculation uh, and uh, uh, and what it means from the point of view of how it realizes this picture of Feynman diagrams kind of uh, closing up. Uh, so again, the main object is the spectral curve. Uh, recall what I said that it's essentially uh, uh, really uh, the resolvent up to a shift. So it determines the eigenvalue density of the poles, uh, uh, lambda a. And uh, recall what the picture I had uh, um, earlier that the poles are uh, associated with each of these colored loops in this uh, picture where which translates co covering maps to uh, 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 to uh, Feynman diagrams we had uh, each of the n poles corresponded to each of the n uh, colored loops uh, and uh, the positions of the and there are each of these loops has a pole inside and um, so in the large n limit when you have a large number of uh, um, uh, uh, degree a degree of a uh, very large uh, n then uh, you will have of course lots and lots of these big contractions it's a bit like considering trace phi to the w for large w and then the free field diagrams will have lots of big contractions uh, of order n uh, i mean of order w uh, big contractions um, and uh, so th there will be several big contractions between any given vertex and the uh, and another uh, consistent with planarity and what the spectral curve does is essentially measure the number of big contractions. And that's the key thing, because you see the, uh, the number of poles is, uh, is the measure of the number of big contractions for the reason that I said there's a pole associated with each of these uh, sort of um, uh, colored uh, loops. Um, uh, uh, so the number of uh, poles is, a me is measures the number of big contractions. And, uh, and the number of poles is essentially what the spectral curve is counting. So the integral of this spectral curve along sort of a contour like this essentially counts the number of Nij is the sort of number of big contractions between the ith vertex and the jth vertex. So the spectral curve is essentially counting these uh, big contractions. Uh, and uh, so the spectral curve, recall, is uh, like this. It has all these branch cuts. And what are these branch cuts? These branch cuts are nothing but all these poles coalescing into cuts. That's what you normally have in a matrix model. The, uh, the lambda a's, which were playing the role of the eigenvalues, are kind of coalescing into a cut in the large n limit. And these period integrals are counting how many of these eigenvalues are there. And that, as I just said, uh, is uh, uh, counting the number of big contractions. And uh, the fact that uh, the number of big contractions uh, obey this constraint, because at any given vertex, the total number of lines coming out is fixed. It's like trace phi to the w or uh, sigma to sigma w has uh, uh, order actually two w lines coming out of it so uh, the number of big contractions of course must obey some constraint like that but that's actually nothing but the cons uh, the fact that the residue of the poles of y which is sort of a sum over all the uh, cuts surrounding a given a given um, uh, pole or uh, 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 zi, which corresponds to a vertex, uh, that that's uh, that is fixed to be alpha i. So uh, so these uh, so there are the constraints that uh, the nigs obey are automatically built in into this uh, spectral curve, and therefore you these different periods that I mentioned in my last slide the different periods of the spectral curve are essentially those which parameterize the different Feynman diagrams and therefore inequivalent coverings because they are the ones which correspond to all the different uh, the periods are these ends so the different numbers of big contractions and you can imagine like in a large and Yang-Mills theory uh, you're essentially 
counting all the Feynman diagrams by the different numbers of big contractions that are there between vertices and those parameterize the different Feynman diagrams and in this case the different inequivalent covering maps and that's the what this period integral does. So the global picture, I showed you a picture around any of these cuts, but the global picture is that you have a whole system of cuts like this, which, um, which is actually dual to uh, a, a skeleton version of the original Feynman diagram. A skeleton version is where I kind of view all these multiple homotopic edges as sort of one. Uh, I glue them all together and I have, uh, 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 so the cuts are actually perpendicular or dual to the original Feynman diagram and uh, they form a, a dual graph. Uh, uh, so the, uh, the, uh, so this is essentially what the spectral curve tells you because these uh, vertices are the zeros of the a spectral curve, which there are two n minus four of them. Uh, there are n faces because each face is the one which is associated with a pole, zi, these poles. So each face of this uh, uh, black graph is, uh, uh, is associated with a single pole. Uh, and, uh, and there are three n minus six edges because n uh, Three and uh, two n minus six independent ones, and plus the uh, residue coming from the sum of these. So uh, three. Uh, so this is what. So this is a planar triangulation uh, with uh, of this uh, uh, um, planar triangulation, which is dual to the original Feynman diagram, the endpoint function, uh, original Feynman diagram, and uh, uh, so this is the graph theoretic. Uh, kind of so you see uh, uh, the uh, matrix model very naturally gives you some kind of a dual graph to this uh, uh, Feynman diagram that we originally had and uh, the uh, different uh, you you're just specifying the different uh, periods of this spectral curve around the independent edges of this graph and those parameterize the different Feynman diagrams or the different covering maps. But the spectral curve itself has a mathematical significance, uh, which is very important uh, because that's what really uh, tells us that this is a string theory, uh, because it is what is called a Strebel differential. A Strebel differential is a quadratic differential on the on a Riemann surface, which has a certain number of double poles at the punctures, uh, the zi's, and and you recall that our our y naught square also has the has these double poles. And uh, with real residues, which our spectral curve has, uh, and moreover, the most crucial uh, condition for a, a quadratic differential to be a Strebel differential is that if you integrate between the square root of this uh, Strebel differential, which is a single differential, you integrate that between two zeros. So, uh, so in this case, you recall there were all these zeros, which were essentially the uh, the zeros were these vertices, the endpoints of the cuts. Uh, so you integrate between the zeros, the period integral, which would in general be complex, uh, uh, has to be real. So all the different integrals have to be real, and in fact, with some orientation positive. Uh, so. Um, uh, so this is not uh, obviously satisfied by any generic uh, quadratic differential. And when it is satisfied, then this uh, differential is called the Strebel differential. And this is indeed true in our case, because these periods you recall, which are uh, the, essentially the integrals between the cuts, uh, these uh, periods are proportional to the number of these uh, big contractions and uh, and these are real and these are real numbers. So uh, so what the matrix model naturally gives you is uh, this uh, uh, gadget called the Strebel differential. Uh, and the, the significance of the Strebel differential is that it foliates the Riemann surface into what are called 
horizontal trajectories, uh, which are essentially curves uh, such that uh, phi dz square is positive. Uh, uh, so in a, on the complex plane, the Strebel differential is the usual dz square, and the horizontal trajectories are essentially lines horizontal to the x-axis. Uh, uh, but on a Riemann surface, you uh, an arbitrary differential, if you looked at the condition that it phi dz square should be positive, uh, uh, will give you locally there'll be a, a direction, but it will not foliate it. It will sort of spiral in and so on. It, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamical systems like problem. And what you have uh, for a Strebel differential is this foliation whereby things are closed uh, except for a set of uh, kind of cuts between the zeros uh, of the Strebel differential. These A's are the zeros of the Strebel differential. And so this, uh, the Riemann surface is foliated into these uh, disks, each of which contains a double pole and um, has these uh, and has this sort of a graph separating all these uh, 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 all these disk domains. And uh, this uh, graph, which is called the critical graph of the Strebel differential, is precisely the same graph that I drew in my previous slide. It's the graph of the cuts, because these are between the zeros, and they are the ones which are dual to the Feynman diagram. It's this black graph over here, which the matrix model gave you, and that has uh, that is precisely this uh, graph of the Strebel uh, differential. And um, uh, so the, the significance for us of the Strebel differential is coming back to the question that was asked right at the beginning, that uh, uh, this it gives a cell decomposition of the modelized space. Uh, and the way it does it is through these lengths, uh, these periods which are real. Uh, these real periods, and you can see on this uh, surface with the same counting that I mentioned earlier, uh, this 2n minus 6 uh, periods, uh, these 2n minus 6 real lengths give you a parametrization of the modelized space. Uh, cell decomposition, uh, which each cell corresponds to a different topology of the graph. And, uh, uh, and for a given topology of the graph, the lengths give you a parametrization of the modelized space. So there's a canonical way you can associate a closed string surface to that Strebel graph. And it's actually what this horizontal trajectory tells you. You should think of these as sort of the cylinders uh, these horizontal trajectories are sort of uh, 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 these foliation as essentially cylinders coming in with uh, Z's going mapped to infinity. The double poles are mapped to infinity. These cylinders are coming in and kind of uh, uh, these uh, cylinders are coming in and they are cut intersecting along this graph uh, around here. So the gluing of these cylinders is what the Strebel graph tells you. And these are the sort of vertical, these are these horizontal trajectories that I mentioned. So it's a very uh, uh, precise way in which you assign a closed string surface to this uh, um, uh, to this, uh, uh, to these Feynman graphs, and, uh, uh, and sorry, uh, Rajesh, uh, could you say yeah. what the figure on the left here is with the black, red, and blue? Is that also represented uh, somehow on the previous graph or not? Uh, yeah, you should think of this as the Feynman diagram. So I should have drawn an earlier diagram. I mean, I can't draw more than three-point functions. So if you wish, you should think of this as a three-point function with three, uh, like a triangle, uh, three point function and, and uh, three ribbon graphs between them. So now I've brought these ribbon graphs. So these are open string diagrams, which are the original Toft diagrams. Uh, and it's these open string diagrams, which are being glued together to form the closed string diagram. So this, this side is really an intermediate step from the original Feynman diagram that was here. So each of these strips are are the strips that are getting glued together in a very specific way. So that, okay. does that answer your question? Uh, it's, yeah, I guess uh, I can so imagine the usual, like the trivalent open string vertex with like a strip coming in and true strips coming out. But yeah, this is not, not what that. this looks like. Okay. This is not yeah. that because this right. is giving you uh, this. Uh, so the strips are kind of closing to form the closed 
uh, uh, surface. Another way to think of it is think of uh, uh, think of these uh, uh, think of this graph. Uh, think uh, and uh, say this edge, any of these edges here, and think of attaching a semi-infinite strip to each of these. So there's a way to kind of, you can, uh, uh, so, and all these strips are getting glued together at this, uh, uh, this thing, and then, so. The semi-infiniteness is out, uh, uh, protruding out of the page. Is coming yeah, out of uh, if okay. you wish. I mean, it's the double pole. I mean, this is a double pole, so it's sort of you should think of these as uh, cylinders I coming see. out okay, of the okay. uh, uh, page, see. and that's yeah. sort of what these are. These these lines are these horizontal trajectories. They are meeting at this graph. The where the things are meeting is the graph, and that graph is essentially the thing that's coming from gluing together these strips with different uh, widths. Okay. Okay, thank I think I kind of see it. Thank you. Yeah, it, it takes a little while to get uh, uh, get uh, familiar with this. Uh, uh, so, uh, so this is indeed the prescription that had been made on very general grounds on how you can canonically assign open string, uh, go from Feynman diagrams, how you can as realize the slogan of associating to each Feynman diagram a world sheet. And uh, the, uh, in the present case, in fact, this, this fact that these treble lengths are proportional to the number of big contractions is very similar to something that Razamath had actually proposed uh, a, a building on this uh, uh, earlier prescription, except that here we are taking the large n limits, so effectively these take continuous values. So I'm uh, essentially done. Uh, uh, so what I wanted to, uh, what I've, uh, so just to step back in case uh, it was, uh, went by uh, fast, uh, what I wanted to essentially say is here that the sum over all the inequivalent covering maps that contribute to a given correlator of the symmetric orbifold, which you can also view as inequivalent Feynman diagrams com uh, contributing to that correlator, that sum is, is the sum over these nijs. And, and in the large n limit, it goes over to an integral over these uh, periods, this uh, 2n minus 6 periods that I just mentioned over here, uh, these, uh, these periods uh, over the different cycles. Uh, um, uh, so the sum goes over because it's essentially the same flat measure. So you get a flat measure on these uh, strebel lengths. And that uh, there's a canon uh, canonical way to, it's a transcendental relation between the strebel lengths and the usual uh, uh, Zs that's given by this period integrals. Uh, uh, the period integrals tell you the relation between the, the usual Zis uh, and the, the lengths. Uh, so, uh, so you get some top form on moduli space uh, from just this. So you, so this is the part which tells you how to go. That Feynman diagrams essentially go over to an integral over moduli space, and it's a bijective correspondence. So one is to one correspondence. So you cover exactly the whole of moduli space in this way and exactly once. Uh, but now, perhaps more interesting is what is this stringy integrand telling you? The stringy integrand is uh, there we have Lun and Mathur to tell us that in the correlator, each such covering map comes with a weight, which is the Liouville action that I mentioned. Now, the Liouville action, remember this conformal factor, at some point I had related it to the spectral curve. Uh, and the spectral curve is this Strebel differential, which, but it also is related to the Schwarzschild of the uh, covering map. So this Liouville action actually, uh, this this additional term is essentially there to regularize things. This Liouville action really becomes a modulus of the Schwarzschild of the covering map. So this is, I, I think, the a very natural ADS three analog of what was uh, shown for ADS2, where you have uh, where you have a boundary whirl line and you have a Schwarzschian from the whirl line to the boundary of ADS2, uh, the Schwarzschian of the sort of the embedding map uh, to the ADS2 uh, gave you the, uh, the leading action. 
the leading sort of universal piece for the softly broken conformal symmetry. So the claim here is that for ADS3, you have a similar universal kind of a piece coming out from at least in this limit, which is now the modulus of the Schwarzian, which is the natural thing, but of the covering map, which is the analog of the map from the world sheet now, instead of a world line, from the world sheet to the boundary of the ADS3, the S2 boundary of the ADS3. So sorry, you can, there uh, are other, sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm still, uh, where are the other dimensions? I'm just, I'm just being quite slow. Yeah, on. yeah, uh, so I'm, uh, I, I, I'll just come to it in a little, uh, this thing, yeah. The other dimensions, uh, uh, yeah, uh, le, le, maybe uh, le, le, it's, uh, this thing. Uh, so it, the, in sort of a world sheet terms, there's another way to, there are sort of three ways in which you can recast this Liouville action, which I think give you sort of complementary things. So this is, I think, a way which kind of tells you there's a, the Schwarzschild, I think, is a way to which would be more like a space time, uh, this thing, even if one understands it eventually. And those sort of ways in terms of breaking of the uh, conformal symmetry of the bulk. Um, um, the, but there's another way in which you can write this as sort of, there's a natural flat metric associated with the Strebel differential. And this action is essentially the number go to action with that uh, induced Strebel metric. Uh, but um, to answer Eva's question, uh, the uh, the complete answer is that, well, the complete answer is that this Liouville action is really the on-shell ADS3 sigma model action uh, where phi is the radial direction. This uh, conformal factor is actually the radial direction. So this is something which we had shown earlier from the world sheet point of view, that if you look at the world sheet action, uh, the world sheet theory, then this Liouville factor of lunin mathur was essentially the radial direction of the ADS3. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so we, see a, a signature of that in this way coming from the field theory uh, by the fact that uh, uh, if you expressed it, this induced metric here, this number go to action is not an embedding into, it's not the induced metric on the sphere. In fact, it's more if you write it in terms of the sphere coordinates, x of z is the same as gamma of z. It's more like these actions of these rigid strings, which you get in terms of an extrinsic curvature uh, on uh, of an embedding inside a larger space. So I suspect that this extrinsic curvature like uh, this thing is what will tell you the, uh, that it's embedded in an ambient ADS3. But it would be nice to go off shell. The, 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 the thing that we still haven't really, uh, um, which this thing doesn't uh, in a natural, in an, any immediate way give you is the off shell sigma model, because you're really computing the correlator, which is sort of uh, the, uh, the world sheet correlator, which is after you've done the sigma model integral. But I think you can sort of uh, read into these things, the extrinsic curvature, the ADS3 uh, geometry, uh, uh, and that's something we are uh, currently this thing, but you oh, can- so, so, so you're saying, I should, think of your, sorry, I, should, yeah. I, should, I should think of your result as, uh, you're having already done the path integral over all the embedding coordinates except phi. Is that, is that? Yeah, in okay, some thanks, sense, thanks. Uh, yeah, in some sense. I mean, the you, in a sense, also done it for the boundary S2, but you left with some kind of zero modes, which are essentially these, whole, because these are holomorphic, X of Z is holomorphic. So you kind of left with these zero modes on the boundary, which is what the covering map tells you. Uh, so, um, uh, I think there's a, probably a better way to view this, uh, and she, uh, and I think this extrinsic geometry is a hint that uh, will should tell you that this phi is really the radial direction. I mean, because that this is a solution of the on-shell sigma model. You can see that this phi, which is log of del gamma, is uh, is the uh, is the solution of the ADS three sigma model. Is the so, this phi is is not dynamical, right? This phi, the three yeah, direction so is not dynamical in your in your setup. It's it, uh, yeah. What you see is it is it is just the uh, on shell. It is the on shell solution. So it's uh, it, obey, uh, it obeys it uh, obeys uh, 
uh, the uh, matrix modal equation, right? So, um, right, exactly. So they're all on shelf. Everything here is on shelf. In, sen in some sense, the x, the boundary coordinates obey del bar x equal to zero. So they are purely holomorphic. Uh, and the phi obeys the, exactly the Liouville type uh, uh, equation. Wait, so the, sorry, they're, hol they're holomorphic as opposed to being um, sourced by the, uh, by the external state? Uh, no, they are sourced. I mean, okay, they have okay. sources at the, the at the insertions, but yeah, so Del X okay. with the sources. But what okay. I mean is uh, they they don't have the Z bar dependence. I mean, no, it's I understand. Not, I, understand. I, I just wanted to make sure I understand. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, the sources I, are there. In fact, the sources are crucial because the, that's what captures right. all the branching data in the covering map. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. just making sure. So, so, so in that sense, this already is like the saddle i mean that right that's what you're yeah uh, okay. but you see i mean there is a further saddle you can talk about you can talk about amongst all the covering maps because now there are not a finite number of covering maps in this gross mende like limit there's you've co you've covered the whole modelized space so you have a modelized space worth of covering maps and you can ask which covering map amongst these minimizes the modulus of the Schwarzschild. So that's the extremization problem, which I was talking of when you asked the question earlier. Uh, you can, that's a further saddle point you can ask. Uh, so, and I think that's an interesting mathematical question. I don't know if anyone has studied it in the maths literature. It seems like a natural functional, you would try to extremize uh, 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 um, subject to some branching data, uh, uh, but it must be some kind of minimal surface in the ADS3, but I think that will, also, finding that will also probably give you more of an insight into the geometry uh, of the thing. But it's now a well-posed mathematical question. OK, so Emil, I'm essentially. Go, oh, sorry. I yeah. think Emil I mean, uh, raised his uh, hand. Uh, Maybe he wants to ask a question. Yeah, um, so I was uh, just following up Eva's question. So the, if I was doing the world sheet path integral, I would have a you know, bunch of uh, functional determinants for the T4 part of the, the theory. Yeah. Uh, is, yeah. is that st that's still true in your formalism, right? Yeah, yeah. So it is, it, is it because you're on some gross would... mending limit that uh, you can ignore all of that? Yeah, they are subleading. Yeah, I didn't say that, but this action is proportional to n square, which you can see from here because del phi is actually proportional to n. So there's a e to the minus n square. So this is the dominant piece. And then there are prefactors to this e to the minus s, which uh, go at most as e to the minus n. So they are subdominant. And uh, what's the relation to the n that's appearing in this to the central charge? Are you still working in some no, limit? No, there's no relation. And the central charge, this C is just fixed. It's just six or whatever for the torus, yeah. Right, it, but, are, but are you in some limit where where the the C is sort of asymptotically large because the-, the Not F1 this C. Uh, this C refers to the seed torus. Uh, the seed CFT. So that's always fixed to be six or whatever in our case. But um, uh, we are already, already take, we have always been working in the limit where the symmetric product, the K, that's what I called the K of the symmetric product T4 to the K, that K is taken to infinity so that we are, so that we can work in a sort of a genus expansion and we are doing we could perhaps uh, restricted here to genus zero on that in the world sheet but you could in principle go to one of our k corrections okay so so is the thing that this is computing then some kind of endpoint function for uh light conical defect operators in in the, in the language of gravity yeah, you could you could think of it that way yeah because they are going they are still perturbative string states they are but they become heavy yeah they 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 become heavy and they are they would be some kind of they're, they're sort of conical defects which are sort of large yeah, relative to the yes scale yeah. but small relative to the to the yeah the yeah scale. yes okay Okay, so I think I've uh, uh, gone uh, 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 over time. Let me just uh, close uh, by just saying that this was a test case, I think, where in a way, uh, even if perhaps some of the details uh, escaped you, but uh, it is something if you just uh, 
look into it, you'll see that it everything is very explicit and you can just you're able to carry this out uh, very concretely. And, um, uh, and in this case, we had the additional advantage that we could close the circle from the other side. We could go from strings to fields because of the tractable world sheet theory. So it all sort of meshes together in a very, uh, uh, in a very uh, uh, tight way. Uh, and so this uh, holds out the hope that in but that this, especially going from fields to strings in this way was uh, in a way proposed not with the symmetric orbifold in mind. And it was a pleasant surprise that the symmetric orbifold, uh, which is not quite, doesn't immediately fit in into the usual Toft framework, but nevertheless very naturally uh, ha uh, ha has the same feature. So it, it gives, uh, uh, I think psychologically, it sort of tells us that it should be possible to do this for large NQFTs in general. And uh, this is something we are doing with uh, some of the students here. There are general lessons for the world sheet theory also, I think an underlying topological string that Matthias and I are uh, fleshing out. Um, and as I said, general lessons from field theories that there's some underlying geometric picture for Feynman diagrams in terms of some kind of a auxiliary covering space. I think this picture will be there in general. Uh, in our paper, we have a long laundry list of various problems, various things I think that are very much in, uh, in hand now to, uh, to, to do. And, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll leave it here for the moment. Thanks, and um, thanks for your patience. Thank you, Rosa. It was wonderful. Let's mute ourselves and uh, give a round of applause. More questions for Rajesh? I have a sort of a question, maybe not directly related to the talk. So this, does this lunin mathur uh, covering space apply also to bosonic, just bosonic symmetric products? Yes. And In fact, the original paper was purely bosonic. Uh, and then so, they, yeah, mm -hmm. because it's anything which is a symmetric product. Uh, so you could take this kind of uh, gross Mende limit even there. Even there, yeah. So that's one okay. of the things which I think is uh, something I still don't have a very good idea uh, of. Are all of these things, do they have a dual string theory description? It seems yeah. like they at least meet some of the necessary criteria, whether there are additional sufficiency criteria. I still don't know whether the correlators that they give you do they have to obey some additional consistency condition to be a good world sheet theory? Maybe, maybe but not. Maybe there are I guess a large this... number of bosonic theories which also have, uh, uh, mm. which also have a dual bosonic or some kind of uh, string theory uh, dual. After all, we expect QCD to have it. Uh, so uh, yeah, and uh, so one of the nice things about this general approach is that it doesn't use supersymmetry or any of these features. But in the in the actual the world sheet theory the PSU one comma one slash two there the supersymmetry is probably important. Yeah, there we, uh, we so in the way we actually went from the other side from the string theory to the field theory we use the very specific supersymmetry and definitely there it seemed as if some features of the world sheet uh, were I mean supersymmetric features were important but but again uh, mm -hmm. not in a definitive way I mean we we we, we can't say that we can't sidestep those things, but uh, but that's uh, at least, um, but going from fields to strings, it seems at least the fact that you get an organization into the modelized space and so on, that's, that's I think, universal. Now the you can ask the question whether the integrand on the modelized space must satisfy additional consistency, some kind of bootstrap requirements. Uh, and I, I suspect there is some relation between the bootstrap conditions in the space-time CFT and bootstrap conditions in the world sheet CFT. It's something I've been uh, kind of advocating, but um, which, uh, which, may be, uh, which may tell you something about this, but I, I don't have anything more concrete to say. Okay. Then more questions. 
otherwise let's uh, thank uh, uh, no, I have uh, one more maybe go question ahead. if maybe since if we have the time could you explain that uh, that cylinder diagram again sorry i was thinking about uh, it yeah. uh, uh, no, yeah, no, it's actually oh, sorry, uh, sorry. it's it's a, just a trick of the mind in some sense i should have drawn a, i should have had a better picture i ha i mean some of my students have drawn a better picture. So if you can imagine a, a, a quadrilateral here between A1, Z1, A3, and Z3, you see a quadrilateral here? Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, think of a conformal mapping, which takes that quadrilateral to a strip, uh, because okay. Z1 and Z3 are going to infinity. And mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. uh, this one, Z1, A1, A, Z3 is one vertical side and Z1, A3, uh, uh, Z3 is the other vertical side of the strip. So uh -huh. essentially you can uh, divide up this whole Riemann surface into quadrilaterals. So there's another mm -hmm. one here, Z1, A3, A4, Z2. So this quadrilateral. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's another strip. So all these strips are essentially fusing together. Uh, uh, so mm -hmm. if you go to a certain canonical coordinates of the uh, of this uh, differential, these essentially can be conformally mapped to strips. And these strips are fusing together at the poles. Uh, so you see this strip as well as this strip are both meeting at this pole Z1 as well as another strip which is going, which is here, going mm -hmm. to infinity. So three, three strips are meeting here at this pole. That's essentially what this is. These strips are meeting at the pole. You can see it over here. And this is what the, this is just a conformally equivalent, uh, this thing of, so these are those strips that I was mentioning, those quadrilaterals. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and these go to, oh, the, these are the, the Zs. Uh, and uh, the zeros are where uh, the the A's okay, are the yeah. zeros, which are where these things meet. So the Z's are the yeah. So okay, these okay. Poles, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And then these A's are the zeros. It, it's it, it's a very pretty picture if you actually stare mm -hmm. at it for mm -hmm. some time, uh, and it just captures exactly your intuition of how these things should be mm -hmm. uh, should be meeting and doing. And, and you had this action, which is this D2Z of absolute value of the, with this two dimensional thing. Yeah. In some extensions of the Maldasena Stanford Yang, people write down this Alexev Shatashvili action. It, yeah. It, is this, related somehow or what's the um, I guess Jorit was saying it's some limit of the Alexei of Shortashvili that gives you the Schwartz here and then is it in that family of uh, yeah there is probably some way to think of it I think in this case um, uh, in the ADS2 case I think uh, Spenta Wadia and Gautam Mandel and others had uh, some use the square joint uh, orbit quantization of uh, Verosoro to uh, uh, to arrive at this uh, kind of a Schwarzschild like action, uh, mm -hmm. and so that was for a single copy of the Verosoro. Here, I guess there are um, you you have uh, uh, multiple copies. Uh, I mean, you have two copies of the Verosoro and. So perhaps there is something uh, like that, but I, I haven't uh, thought uh, about it very much. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, but the, it must be, I think there must be some sense in which, because these correlators are softly breaking the supersymmetry of the, uh, uh, the, the conformal symmetry, sorry, of the, mm, uh, uh, of the theory by, you know, and just the fact that the correlators are of arbitrary operators you're inserting. So you're in mm -hmm. some sense mm -hmm. kind of uh, breaking the, the conformal symmetry. And this is probably capturing the that effect of those zero modes. But uh, that's, uh, so at some very general kind of level, it seems to be what's going on. But, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but yeah. And uh, 
also this phi is the same phi with respect to which we can write if we take d phi whole squared that is like we can expand that into Virasoro modes and there are these Virasoro conditions on the matrix model. Yeah, it's essentially uh, so that, yeah, essentially it, that, that's right. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, right. these are, yes. this Delphi square, uh, this Y is Delphi mm -hmm. and the, it obeys these loop equations and uh, you can think of the Virasoro conditions as capturing that same thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but it's not something I've uh, explored so much, but I, I, I suspect that this phi, I mean, it's related to Eva's question also, this phi, I mean, from the point of the symmetric orbifold, it is just some conformal factor, uh, and it's this uh, pullback, uh, this thing, but the phi has the geometric interpretation as being the radial direction of ADS3. This is what we found in our earlier mm -hmm investigation there because there was a in fact, exactly if you parameterize the radial direction as I mean the sigma model as e to the two phi del x del bar x on the boundary plus del phi del bar phi if you mm -hmm. parameterize the ADS3 sigma model that way then this phi is the same phi it's the uh, so this phi is really that radial direction and uh, so yeah, I think this whole idea of this uh, scale in where the scale factor in the CFT being related to the radial direction, you see uh, it concretely over here, but it would be good to sort of do it directly from field theoretic terms without using the crutch of, you know, having that world sheet thing behind in the back of your mm -hmm. uh, uh, head. Uh, so maybe this way of thinking about it, uh, it might, uh, there's probably a way to think about it, which is, exhibits that in more uh, in direct fashion, but yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, um, okay, thanks. Is, is, um, is there some relation of this Lewell field to what you get from uh, uh, the Hamiltonian reduction of SL2 churn Simons? I think so. I think, uh, uh, I, yeah, I think it is essentially that uh, because that's, uh, it's the, as you know, the ADS3 sigma model, if you write it as uh, uh, del bar phi, del phi plus e to the two phi, del and the boundary coordinates, then this phi, I think, is essentially, isn't that the same parameterization that gives you uh, one of the radial gauge field or something like that? Yeah, it's probably a, a closely related, but. Uh, um, this phi is another way to say it is that it's the thing that enters in the Wakimoto type of free field construction of ADS3. So uh, the, the currents you write in terms of phi and, uh, and the boundary coordinates uh, gamma. So, uh, so that, uh, that free field construction, I guess, follows from this uh, similar, this. Uh, Hamiltonian reduction, right? Uh, uh, so I suspect that that's, yeah. They're, they're so, very so, so is, is, is this sort of another route to getting at um, computing um, uh, well, so for instance, uh, you know, people look at conformal blocks to compute the, you know, light, 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 light correlators in, um, um, in CFTs. Um, you know, in the large C limit. So uh, is, there, is there something in what you're doing that could be easily compared to existing results on those sorts of things? Yeah, uh, so the, the, those were, if you remind me, just too heavy, too light, right? Or something like that? Uh, or well, there, it... there's a whole family of things you can consider. So I mean, yeah, so, people who are interested in probing black holes look at heavy, heavy, light, light, but you could also consider light, 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 light. But the light, 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 uh, how, how do you see the central? I mean, I thought you needed something heavy to see the uh, central, uh, no, uh, or? No, just scattering of conical defects. Uh, in, in okay. the yeah, I, I haven't thought of it, but they're, they're might be, there should be. I mean, we are, as you said, uh, we are looking at these conical defects here, uh, and there's, uh, we are looking at the scattering of that uh, from the point of view. 
So uh, if one, um, so we did it purely from the before point of view, but you can look at it from the bulk point of view and, uh, uh, and uh, probably, uh, uh, yeah, this limit, as far as I know, directly, I have not seen it in the bulk, uh, but uh, I might be mistaken. Uh, but uh, if it is there, presumably you should see something like this. Yeah, the fact that this will yeah, you get this e to the minus c, it smells a little like these sort of uh, universal pieces that you get uh, in those um, things. But uh, yeah, I haven't made a close comparison. OK. Very interesting. I also had a, a question. So but now you've considered these um, correlation functions of twist operators. But mm -hmm. say I insert besides these twist operators, say one other operator that uh, okay, it's, it's maybe in the twisted sector. But how mm -hmm. does that sort of change the um, this this mapping to the world sheet? Is there some natural way of thinking about these other operators? Or uh, yeah, so of course uh, the untwisted states are correspond to W equal to one in this language, uh, uh, so. Uh, so, of course, that's very far from any large W limit. Uh, so you would presumably have to take a large W for uh, all the others and then no, think of this additional thing as a probe or a kind of a, uh, this thing. I, I think you would still get uh, the, because the other, the other correlators will generate the background. So that will generate the world sheet because all those yeah. big contractions mm -hmm. will give you the same, uh, there'll be multitude of it's covering like... maps that involve those and it will uh, cover the world sheet. But then this one will sort of perturb it, but it will be something you would probably have to look carefully to see because it's a suppressed uh, contribution. You'll have to carefully tease it out. Will uh, it be like um, one eigenvalue instanton or something? Yeah, in yeah matrix something model? like that, yeah, some... yeah some, mm -hmm. something like that. So it's a little bit probably difficult to tease out, but um, but maybe because it's, yeah, you might be just by looking at the functional dependence or something like that, be able to uh, and to pull it out. Uh, I see, yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. now that's an interesting question. It would be like uh, on this background, you're kind of perturbing it a little bit. And, and Do these banner like, Banner like matrix models have ZZ brains or? Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, so I think that's what these were. Uh, 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 in the original, uh, I, I think in the original um, digraph wafer like uh, description, these were essentially like the brains of the dual. Uh, the, the analog of the ZZ mm -hmm. brains, uh, they were Z minus ZI determinant of these. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so that's what uh, this potential gives you the products of determinants. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so, so you, you, uh, putting in one more is like adding a single, so you have a background generated by these. So as you're saying, these would all be of order. Uh, these are, uh, there would be of order N uh, with the right scaling, but then there would be a one over N piece, which would be like a probe uh, D brain in that language. Uh, the, the one extra uh, yeah. piece, which, uh, which is sort of floating there. But actually it's a little funny because somehow, yeah, Wi equals to, well, you can consider probably Wi equals to two because Wi equals to one doesn't change the covering map very much. Uh, but the covering maps remain the same because Wi equals to one means that it's a regular point. It, it, there's no branching. Uh, right, so, right. so the covering maps don't really change, but yeah, you could look at Wi equals to two or something like that uh, to really perturb it. Uh, uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, uh, yeah, that would be interesting. This some picture like that. Uh, yeah. More questions. Yeah, I guess a, a concrete yeah, thing to ahead. do there would be to take this y of z that that the matrix model outputs and the effective potential is like the one integral of y, right? It's the 
it's an integral of y and then look for other extrema of that like some maxima or something hmm. but yeah anyway yeah. sorry yeah yeah it would be a one over n additional piece to this uh, whole thing and uh, mm, yeah but is it more like an additional brain or in, like in one eigenvalue yeah, and stuff an additional on? brain in that sense uh, from this point of view uh, All right. Um, if there are no further questions, let's uh, let's thank Rajesh uh, once more. Yeah. Thanks uh, very yeah. much for stay uh, for your uh, for adjusting the time to this uh, period and. Yeah, we were it. very glad to to do that. I mean, uh, before we had uh, Suvrat uh, talk uh, about some yeah. some stuff. So yeah, but. Uh, I mean, some positive things come out of the COVID also. <laughs> right. like, this would never have happened uh, before, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even we've had a lot of uh, speakers whom we would not otherwise have had uh, no. easily in our series. So, yeah. Uh, interesting, yeah.